Hey, uh, thanks everyone for uh, joining. And uh, I've been joined by Anthony Lewis again. I don't know the number of times Anthony has been here, but Anthony has been here for a long time. But this time, uh, it's uh, it's the book release of uh, uh, Anthony's. And uh, I think, I, I don't know, maybe it, it should be like 10th or 11th book that you're publishing. And, I, I don't, I haven't counted. Yeah, it's so some, it's, somewhere up there. <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah, so it's so much that you cannot count. So. Uh, so thank you so much for Ant uh, joining Anthony and uh, it's, a, it's, it's a great pleasure especially to have you today to talk about the new book which is getting released uh, tomorrow uh, that is uh, 8th of February uh, 2021. So I think it's getting released tomorrow across the world because I, I think India. so yeah. yeah. So I live in India and it shows February 8th so it has to be uh, worldwide release. So, congratulations, first of all. Well, thank for, you, uh, and it's always a pleasure to be here and chat with you. So, so and it's 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 a it's a great experience because you you had shared a copy of the book uh, uh, in March two thousand and twenty when we were all uncomfortably entering into the lockdown. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I used to read this book uh, uh, on my tab. So I, I just used to run through the book. So, and you're you, basically your, uh, you, I mean, horror has always been one of your major interests in astrology. Although you, you kind of run through most of the other uh, forms of astrology as well. But horror, horror astrology is also one of your major interests. And this is not your first book on horror. So you have already published uh, uh, two or three books in horror astrology, like, horror astrology, plain and simple, mm -hmm. and so on. And this book is uh, specifically on lost objects. So I just wanted to... Uh, see, lost objects is one of the most important things, and people are so curious about uh, finding out their lost objects. And uh, the general nature of horror astrology itself is extremely uh, catchy, and uh, most inquisitive people are always, uh, you know, uh, tied to horror astrology for its very nature. So uh, we, we have already spoke about your entry into horror astrology and how you uh, uh, how you got acquainted to astrology and what what made you uh, realize that horror astrology is actually uh, a proof that astrology works, uh, although it is uh, for, it it needs and it kind of it is one of the forms of divination. You have uh, uh, you you mentioned earlier that you had realized that horror astrology helped you understand that astrology actually works. Uh, so let's not get into all those things now and we'll just okay. keep it with the book because uh, you've already mentioned it uh, in one of your earlier videos. I think it's one of the very first videos that we did on horror astrology, uh, probably about two years back. And you also spoke about your interest in horror astrology with Lodi Kozan, one of our mutual friends from Europe. So I think people can check out those videos. I'll try and add a link to those videos to see uh, what interested you in horror astrology. And also those videos will showcase the prowess of yours in terms of uh, using horror astrology at a practical, uh, in a practical framework. So let's just talk about this book and let's ask you what kind of drove you to write this book, uh, especially on lost objects. Okay. <clears throat> Well, to me, finding lost objects is one of the most remarkable aspects of horror astrology. Because the idea that you can ask a question and look at a chart and follow the rule, the so-called rules that we've inherited, and they'll lead you to the location of the missing object is quite remarkable to think yeah. about. And the fact that it often works, you know, it's not infallible, it's not 100%, but much of the time, uh, you find what you're looking for. <laughs> and to me, that's very gratifying. And often in ways that you didn't expect, but the chart says they must be in this sort of location and you look there and um, I mean, it's just remarkable to me. Okay, and so it, it sort of is a verification, as you mentioned, that as skeptical as people are of astrology and as I have been for many years and still am, <laughs> okay. every time a chart works out, I'm sort of amazed that, gee, this stuff really works. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So before we get into anything, can you just show the copy of the book so that people oh, sure. can see? Yeah, I got a couple copies a couple of weeks ago. So this is what it looks like. It's, um, I'll just thumb through it. So it's a thick book. Uh, yeah, and there's, I think there are 45 different charts and it's what is it, roughly 400 pages. Um, okay. So they did a nice job on the cover. I like Yeah, design. it's amazing. Yeah. I didn't design it. Llewellyn designed it, but uh, they. So it's getting published uh, by Llewellyn Publishers. Right. Uh, who are one of the most, uh, you know, one of the foremost uh, players of uh, traditional astrological publishing. So uh, I'll also share the screen and show the Amazon page of the book so that it's easier for people to get hold of it. So this is, uh, this is the Amazon page of the book. Mm -hmm. This is amazon.com. So it's important that you, you search with the link uh, based upon your own uh, location mm -hmm. in order to avoid uh, insane shipping cost. So the, it's called the horary, astro horary astrology, the theory and practice of finding lost objects. So we'll also show the cover once here, which is it's very beautiful. Uh, so here we have all these uh, celestial uh, things with uh, with a little bit of you know some stellarium kind of image with fixed stars and stuff, which which kind of embellishes the cover. And uh, we all know what this is. So with with mm -hmm. this, both these colors kind of complement each other, and it's really looking wonderful. And this is the back page. And uh, so, and to just take, I mean, uh, uh, I think here we can find more information. Yeah, it's published by Llewellyn Publishers in English language, 420, 24 pages, and it's 1.85 pounds. 7.4 into 9.2 inches, which is a little bit uh, off uh, offbeat from the regular uh, size of the books, uh, especially when it comes to astrology books. Maybe they, they kind of did this to uh, reduce the number of pages. Otherwise, it, it might have probably been 550 pages if, if it was uh, 6 into 9 inches or something mm -hmm. like that. So I think it's a, it's a strategic move by the publishers. So So you can also find the uh, author details here uh, and I think most of them know about you so uh, just to kind of I should say yeah. you can also they have this look inside feature so that if people are want to get a sense of what the book is about if you click on the look inside you see the cover and then right above it it says look inside that allows you to see the table of contents in the first few pages so you get okay, a sense uh, of uh, uh, oh okay oh here yeah yeah and then, oh yeah, I think this is this is very good. This is very yeah. good. So this is the table of table of contents, right? So, and I think it presents a few of the, uh, the part of the first chapter, so that people can read it to see if it's something that would interest them. Oh, this is excellent. Huh. Okay, so uh, before before this, I just want to kind of uh, uh, open the author page on Amazon and show what other books you have published. Oh. So uh, I, I don't know, but probably this book is for the astrology, plain and simple is your first book. Uh, right. That's for, a revision of the first book. The first book was maybe five, six years before that. And then they asked me to revise it. Okay. But this is the book for which you won this uh, prestigious award. No, it was actually the original. This is yeah. oh. edition two of the original. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, and you also published books on tarot. And, right. Uh, uh, this looks like an e-book on Monday Right. Astrology. There's a few e-books there. Yeah. yeah. This this is one of the e-books, and this is also uh, yeah. one of the e-books. But I think the major book that we are going to talk about is the new book. Mm -hmm. And you have also written a book on the art of forecasting using solar returns. Uh, so the, there is a lot of e-books as well. So uh, I think the page is not going to end. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we, I don't know what that last one is. It looks... Oh, this one? Um, maybe 
uh, your book is published in some Japanese or Chinese oh, language. There is a Japanese translation. I've never seen it, but that must be it. That's interesting. Oh, okay. So this is also, uh, is this on Horary as well? I think the, the Horary uh, was trans, the Horary and the Tarot were both in Japanese. Uh, it's Horary as well. It's written here. So. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, this is the author page of Anthony Lewis and uh, very few people are as prolific as Anthony Lewis. So I think it's important that everyone checks out the work. Uh, uh, maybe we can just run through the table of contents from this Amazon pay, pay page itself, which sure. I didn't really you, uh, plan, you. but it looks like a, a good thing. I don't know. Uh, I think you have to click the look inside button. Oh, okay. And then at the top, see Zoom, you can make it larger if you hit the Zoom. And then go to the table of contents. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we can just quickly jump into the book sure. and, and see. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. So be before, before starting this, so let's just talk about... Uh, uh, this uh, l lost objects and your success uh, as an astrologer uh, or as a hor horary astrologer uh, in using horary astrology in terms of finding lost objects. Uh, because you, I'm sure you have used most of those examples in this book and uh, you, you have also maintained a huge database from, uh, from, from the past, which mm -hmm. probably helped you to kind of accumulate uh, chart example charts for this book, uh, which which probably is super handy uh, in the process of writing the book. So, uh, how how did you find out uh, that uh, you you could actually find out lost objects? I mean, there there were books. Lily uh, William Lily's work is entirely on horror, and he also has a lot of examples on lost objects. So when did you realize that you could actually do it so well? And uh, so what are some of the knacks that people can use uh, to find out lost objects? I know you've spoken about the Lord of the Ascendant and the uh, um, Dispositor of the Moon and so on in the book, but that's so detailed. Maybe we can just give an outline mm -hmm. of uh, uh, what Method. everything is. Okay. Well, you as we've talked about before, I, I've got be, been interested in astrology since I was fairly young, about 11 years old. And in my teens, I was reading about astrology and I came across examples of astrologers being able to find lost objects. Okay. And that intrigued me because it just oh. seemed like a very science, I was always interested in the sciences. So mm. it seemed like a very scientific approach if, if you could you're either going to be right or you're going to be wrong. <laughs> and so you're going to know whether what you did was correct or not. And to me, that was very gratifying. Okay. Because you would get feedback about what you did, as opposed to, say, natal astrology, where you could talk about a character trait. But then a lot of people have the same character traits. So maybe you're, maybe the chart is accurate or maybe it's a lucky guess sort of. But here, you know, you know you're accurate or not because the person either finds what's missing or not. So to me, that was the appeal. It's also a lot like doing a crossword puzzle or any kind of puzzle where sure. you, you have to put the pieces together and see the whole pattern to get the right answer. And in many ways, finding a lost object is like that because the answer should be in the chart, but it's not simple. There's not one factor you have to look at. You have to take all the factors and put them together in a way that they fit and make sense and they lead you or give you clues to where to look. So is your question what's to, to outline the basic method or? No, I, I was just uh, asking you like, uh, what are some of the basic things uh, when you look for uh, lost objects, one is surely the ascendant, the other is the moon, and the other is the quesited right. relationship with the quesited and the uh, sorry, the current and the mm -hmm. uh, ob lost object, and also yeah. the significator of the lost object. So, yeah, 
Okay, so astrologers have been finding lost objects with Hori for probably a couple thousand years. There are the earliest example I found when I was actually researching the original book was one from the fifth century by Palkus, where a slave girl's linen went missing. She thought it was stolen. She went to the astrologer and he told her where to look and who probably stole it. Uh, and I think that was about 498 or roughly in that period, <laughs> late 400s. There may have been earlier ones. But the idea as in all of Horary is that the person who asked the question is represented by the ascending sign and its ruler. So the first thing you have to do is know who asked the question and who who is missing something. Uh, you okay? Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so if I lose something or can't find something, I'm the quote querent, the person asking the question. But if I'm looking for something that specifically belongs to another person, like where is my father's ring or where is my child's toy, then you have to consider who owns the object. It's easiest when the person who's missing something asks the question, because otherwise you get into what's called turning the chart or derived houses, uh -huh. and that can get very complicated. Okay. And basic ideas are one that the second house from any house represents the possessions of that house. So things that I own are represented by the second house of my chart, sure. my money, my resources, and objects that I own, objects that are movable. Yeah. Objects, things that I own that are not movable, like cars, property, things like that, are going to be fourth house. But it would be very hard to lose your house or your apartment, right? Yeah. <laughs> so usually we're going to use the second house to represent a missing object. And the objects people most commonly lose are some money, their wallet, their eyeglasses, their keys. Everybody loses their key, misplaces keys, yeah. their keys. Um, objects of personal use. I think, I, I think some files as well. There was an interesting example on social media where someone lost an important file. And yeah. I remember you, your comments on it. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Right. Books, papers, uh, yeah. files, you know. Uh, USB drives, um, things like that. <laughs> Pens, laptop. laptops, right. And so <laughs> those are all second house <laughs> items because they're possessions of the person. Now, the fourth house is important because traditionally, if you own something valuable, and this is also in the uh, Hindu literature, Hindu astrology, that yes. what you would do is you would bury it in the ground. <laughs> So in that sense, it became part of your, it was hidden on your property somewhere. The fourth house is your property, but it was buried there. So the fourth house became the house of buried or hidden treasure. Treasure meaning hidden valuables. And usually if you're, you're really looking for something and it matters, it's something you value. So the fourth house has that significance. So those are two houses that you'll always look at in trying to figure out where something is that's lost. The possession itself, the second house, and viewing the possession as a hidden or uh, buried treasure somewhere. You look at the fourth house and its ruler, and the, the moon, because of its rapid motion, you know, goes around the chart in 28 days, is a symbol of things that are always on the move, going from one place to another, getting displaced. So the moon is kind of a general signifier of things that aren't where you, where you think they are when you go to look for them because they've changed so rapidly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they change location, just like the moon is always changing location. It spends two and a half days in each sign and moves on. Yeah. So those are the three principal signifiers. And then the fourth is every planet kind of naturally rules something. Uh, so for instance, Mars would be a knife or a gun or a weapon or a cutting instrument or 
a carpenter tool, a hammer, things, things made of metal. Sure. Venus might be jewelry, clothing, items of adornment, lipstick. Um, they have Venusian things. Yeah. Uh, Mercury is sort of little practical things like your keys, your pens, uh, and uh, mobiles. Right. And so you, it, might, it might be your, your computer, right? Things you communicate with, your phone, your. And so you can use the planet that independently of its own nature symbolizes something regardless of what house it rules in the chart. And then sometimes when you look at a chart, something just jumps out at you from the symbolism. I, I can't think of an easy example, but uh, that wouldn't be one of those four things we mentioned, but the chart sort of leads you to say, oh, this is the planet that I must be studying. Um, uh, maybe I'll, I can't think of an example off the top okay. of my head, but that happens. And so then you look at the chart and you see what the planets are doing in the chart. So say, say you lost your, I don't know, your keys. Well, we're going to think of Mercury because that rules keys. We're going to think about the second house ruler. We're going to see where they are in the chart. What house are they in? What sign are they in? And what aspects are they making? And each house and sign is associated with certain locations. Yeah. Uh, so for instance, angular houses, the four angles, one, four, seven, and 10, tend to be locations that are prominent, visible, nearby, uh, where it's easy to find things. And often they're either in your home or in your office or in the place you spend a lot of time. And then there are gradations. So if it's seventh house, say, well, maybe your partner or your spouse has it, or it's in the room he or she spends a lot of time. Uh, if it's the 10th house, maybe it's your office where you work, or maybe it's um, some public space you visited recently. Like if you were, went to a restaurant last night, if it's a place of business, could be 10th house. And if it's a restaurant you go to frequently, maybe you'd look there. If it's a third or ninth house, maybe you <clears throat> misplaced it while traveling. Uh, yeah. For example, um, an astrologer last, I think last year asked me, showed me a chart and said, this person lost, I forget what it was. <laughs> and the significators all involved the ninth house. So I said, what, were they traveling recently? Could it be in a suitcase oh. or something like that? And that's where it was. Great. <laughs> so, so you use... You, I, I think it comes down to presence of mind at the end of the day. You need to have a lot of presence of mind to kind of, you know... Uh, uh, so for, for example, to, uh, to have this idea of suitcase in the mind, it really requires this uh, aptitude and presence of mind. So... But, but ninth house is long distance travel. So it's got to be, or it's also university. So it could be sure. at a library or, but, but I said, has this person traveled recently? You, you use the chart to get clues and you ask questions. You know, Lily said that horary is a combination of common sense and art. Yeah, <laughs> so you have to use your common sense. Pretty much, yeah. yes, sure. Uh, so, I mean, if I looked at ninth house and I said, well, it must be in India because that's a foreign country. Well, that's crazy because unless a person has been to India, it's not going to be. <laughs> but if they tell me, oh, yeah, I just got back from New Delhi yesterday and flew into New York, I would say, oh, maybe it's you left on the plane or maybe it's in the hotel or maybe it's in your suitcase. That's right. So, so it's really like detective work. You're using the chart to give you clues. And you have to know a lot about what happened because the symbols are very general. So you can't look at a chart and say, it's gotta be here, but you've gotta have a dialogue with the person and say, was well, with the ninth house. Have you traveled? Have you been in the library? Were you studying? Are you a student? You know? And when you get the picture, 
Well, I think there's an example in the book. I know there's an example in the book where I got a call from a friend of mine who's, um, they had a family, uh, I, I, uh, they're called iPads, I, the, the portable computer from Apple's. Okay. Uh, I think it's iPad. iPad, okay. That was missing. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know about Apple products, so, but probably it has to be. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It, it was a, a laptop. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you mean, uh, uh, is it the missing iPad example? Yeah, yeah. Do, do and, you want me to just read it or we won't? Uh, it's up to you. It's, it's you know, I how think, much detail you want to get into. Um, uh, yeah, um, maybe it's, uh, it, it, it'll be okay to kind of, I'm not sure if to... Uh, talk about one example I can just uh, I think it was uh, uh, the the story goes like you received a phone call from the sister of a good friend who asked uh, if you could do a chart to locate a missing iPad mm -hmm. and uh, her son was the last person to use the iPad and he insisted that he had left it on the desk in his father's study she asked the question at 12.21pm EDT and you put you put up the chart on computer and continued the phone call with the current. So this chart is set for your location because you are you were taking the question and you were understanding the right. question. I'm the astrologer, yeah. Yeah, so you are trying to find out uh, where the lost object was. So um, I'm, I'm not sure, but maybe uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, how to share the screen because well, I have I, what page that I can hold up the book maybe that would help uh, it's in uh, actually this copy does not have the page number it doesn't have the page okay let but me, maybe let me... you can just search as using right. uh, yeah you can search it it's a 296 let me open it to that page Okay, I, I can see it. Is it clear enough? Or... Oh, one minute. I'll I'll find a way to share the screen. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's it's visible, but maybe it's difficult for you to talk with this. So I'll I'll try and share this screen. Um, okay. One moment. We can just make it happen. Well, why don't I talk about it while you're sure. doing that? Yeah. Well, we can just describe it. So Scorpio is rising. So the queer, the woman who called is Mars. And the second house of the chart, it was kind of the family iPad. They all used it. So it belonged to her and her husband and her son. They were, so she was one of the owners. So I use the second house, which is a Sagittarius house to represent the iPad. And that's ruled by Jupiter. And Jupiter is up in the ninth house and it's in Leo. So I, I asked her these questions. Has he traveled recently? Well, he'd been to camp. <laughs> and seeing Leo, Leo is a sign that has to do with the outdoors, wild animals, doing things in the outdoors, uh, parks, recreation outdoors. So seeing that, I thought, well, he must have left it at camp. <laughs> Is that possible? And he, the kid, of course, denied it. But it turns out that... Uh, never... You have it on the screen now. Okay. They never did find the uh, iPad in the house. And I, I actually thought that it probably was at the camp. They never found the iPad. And she finally concluded that her son must have taken it there and left it there, not realizing, forgetting he had it with him, or maybe somebody took it, or, but it was never found in the home. So she concluded it must have been left at the camp. And maybe he knew he left it there, was too embarrassed to admit to it. <laughs> okay. But uh, it never, it never reappeared. Um, but, but this is a good example of, you're using your logic and trying to fit the chart to the circumstances. Oh, the other thing that made me think her son has it was that Jupiter, which rules the uh, second house of possessions, also rules the fifth of her son. Sure. So there was that connection. The same planet 
that ruled the missing item ruled her son. So th that linked them together symbolically. And the son was also then in the ninth house of, you know, going on a trip somewhere in Leo, probably going outdoors to camp. And that's where the iPad was. Okay. And, uh, so this is the sort of logic you use and uh, detective te technique that you use. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and the other thing that made me think they wouldn't get it back was that the moon, which can also represent missing objects, sure. was in the eighth house. The eighth house is a house of loss and things dying and decaying and going out in the garbage or <laughs> disappearing. Uh, the house of death, right? Yeah, yeah uh, and some some clumsy places like close to uh, the bathroom or something like that. Right. Okay. So. But oh, I find when the eighth house is prominent in these charts, you got to look in the garbage. You accidentally <laughs> threw it in the garbage. It's common. <coughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Which is common you know, with keys or small items. It's easy to, they're with some other junk, some old sure. papers, and you throw things out, then you realize, oh, the keys must have been in with them. Okay. Uh, so that's kind of the, you know, it's sort of an interesting technique, but the symbolism usually fits the situation. And as you follow the symbolism together with the the person asking the question and you try to figure out how does it fit their life and what's happened in the story it often but not always leads you to the item okay okay maybe okay. I, i'll just stop this uh, okay You know, and we just sort of went over some of the basic ideas because yeah. this has been practiced for hundreds and hundreds of years. There's lots of literature and different things people have tried, different methods they've used. So it, it can get somewhat technical and you know, a lot, a lot of the techniques work some of the time, but not all of the time. So you have to use your judgment then. <clears throat> And uh, and you, you spoke about the the chart for the disease. Uh, the, the chart very, for what? The decomposition chart for the disease. Oh right. Uh, so maybe we can just talk about maybe some people uh, just just as to you know to give a clue to people those who are not used to casting those charts. Yeah, that that wasn't a lost per. You can also locate lost persons using these techniques. Okay. But the chart you're talking about, that was just to give an example in the beginning of sure. a, a, a simp sample of a horror chart, not mm. particularly related to um, lost objects. And the story there was, there was an astrologer I knew many years ago and um, she wrote a note, an email, I guess, to all of her colleagues that she'd been diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh. And it was very concerning. And so I did a chart for when I read the email that's worried about what was going to happen to her. And it was pretty ominous. It looked from the chart like the cancer was going to get worse and she would die of it. And that's what happened. So that's uh. not a it's not a very good example. So, well, it's a good example in the sense I mean, that it shows you the sure. power of the technique, but it's a very sad story. Yes, exactly. That's what I mean. And it's the sort of thing that you know you're going to have if you do horror, you're going to get these have yeah. these experiences where it's part the charts look of, very negative, yeah. and you you hope you're wrong, and um, but you're not. It's part of the job. So, yeah, and. Uh, and you you talk about uh, Lily's guidelines and Plotinus guidelines, uh, and also Raphael's guidelines. Before yeah, what you, what I tried into, to do was go through yeah. the literature and give examples of people who did a lot of these types of chart okay. charts, and quote them verbatim. This is how I approached it. Lily is probably the most 
famous person, Gadbury, who was a contemporary and who actually studied with Lilly, had his own guidelines, mostly based on Lilly's. There were later authors like Raphael and Simonite. And there was another contemporary of Lilly at the end, uh, um, Griffin, who he focused mostly on theft. Like okay. Lilly hated uh, horries having to do with theft. He oh, really okay. didn't like to work with them. But Griffin did a whole little booklet on theft, which I've included, and, uh, okay. which is quite detailed. He gives all the rules. And, Okay, and uh, it's uh, uh, later on. It, uh, you write about uh, uh, how I found the uh, girl of my dreams, which I read today morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, sort of not really a lost and found, but the way it, he it, asked the yeah. question. Uh, I mean, this was this is somebody I've known for several years, many years actually, and who periodically asked me to look at his chart. So th this is maybe twenty years after I met this guy. And his story is that he's had a series of relationships and they're always like hot and heavy in the beginning and then they peter out. And his dream was he wanted to finally get married and have a family, but every relationship after several months just ends. Okay. So he met this new woman, I think he was in about his thirties then and thought, oh, this is the one, so he, I think he sent me an email. Have I finally met the woman of my dreams? Have I found the woman of my dreams? <laughs> okay. And the, the chart said no. <laughs> uh, and later, you know, this relationship lasted several months or a year and ended. <clears throat> but the next, the next one, finally, I, I don't think I put this in the book. After yeah, this one in the, in the book, he did meet somebody, and they actually got married and have a child now. So. That's great. It, it did work out eventually, but not with the woman he asked about. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and then you also uh, talk about the Bonatti's variant of uh, uh, reception, and also you talk about Lily's uh, bringing matters to perfection. So, uh, all these are, you know, you, you talk about aspects, uh, train aspects, square aspect, and then uh, yeah. reception, which kind of, you know, uh, gives a complete circle to whatever we are looking at in the chart. So it's not just about the placements of the planets. The aspects are uh, as good as... Yeah, the, the aspects are important from the point of view of when two planets meet by aspect, they approach each other and meet by aspect, then there's a connection between them. And if it's the planet that rules the querent who owns something and the thing that they own and they're coming together by aspect, it means they're going to be rejoined. If they're moving apart, it probably means they're not going to be rejoined. Okay. Yeah, so definitely. looking at the aspects, especially are they approaching or separating yeah. or if there's no aspect forming and there's not going to be any kind of near future, then probably they're not going to get back together again. Sure. So and the point of reception is that if there's reception, meaning that if one planet is passing through an area of the zodiac where the other planet is dignified, then the dignified planet is said to receive the, the planet that's moving through. And if there's an aspect also forming, the reception kind of really helps the, the matter along, helps the matter to perfect or manifest. Okay. Uh, perfect. Uh, and then uh, you move on to Moon's role in horror astrology, and then uh, you talk about Gadbury and again Bonatti and Lily. It's very difficult to ignore Lily while you are doing horror astrology. And right. uh, and after that, you jump into the twelve houses and the attributions, and also I think the geographical locations of yeah. uh, each uh, house. So which is a which is a very uh, preliminary thing uh, before uh, doing horror astrology. So that's quite uh, important. And uh, anyone who is already exposed to horror astrology would have some kind of an exposure to or some kind of knowledge in these aspects, such as which 
as uh, as as to like attribution of houses uh with uh, in terms of horror astrology um and then houses and human body which is always uh, uh one of the most interesting things and also the color uh, based on right. uh which is uh, another interesting thing so because right. you're using the houses and the signs to try to describe where to look yeah uh, um and also to to if something is lost and you want to know specifically which house it belongs to you have to know the house as well to figure out the clues in the chart yeah uh, and then you i think you clearly explain in uh, chapter 17 where you talk about 12 signs and the associated physical locations uh, yeah. so uh, and then you talk about the signs itself uh, because just the sign carries a lot of information for example uh, if the 12th house is a water sign maybe the lost object will be found in a very clumsy place uh, which, which which has some kind of a moisture or water itself so right so and it's important it's important to, to distinguish there's a sort of a modern concept equating signs and houses but they're really distinct okay and so you different attributes will apply to signs than apply to houses and you can't just equate as some people do aries in the first house sometimes that's true but most of the time it's not the first house is probably one of the other 12 signs and so you really have to distinguish what the signs represent and what the houses represent okay and interestingly you bring in the lunar nodes as well which is very new uh by any practicing western astrologer so uh, uh i think it's because of your exploration in jyotish as well which has well, but actually in western the nodes are always important in horary at least modern horary okay i b jacobson used them barbara waters used them okay they tended to see them as um kind of ominous <laughs> like if a planet okay. was in the degree of the nodes watch out fate is going to get you <laughs> uh, so let's leave it uh, as suspense uh, for those who read your book and you also use outer planets i know you are uh, you, you don't ignore outer planets even in horror right. traditionally we they horror used only the visible planets mm. and i use only the visible planets as rulers of the signs okay but i don't ignore the outer planets because they often will give you really important information okay uh after this you give just example after example of for example and uh, uh and finally you go on to uh, appendix where you talk about both lilies and gadbury's houses in horror astrology which is probably one of the one of the important things because the people don't have to move to another book to kind of read all those things so you just give right what i tried to do was if i was going to use a principle in ex- ex- examining a chart to quote the a key source about that principle so people would see where i was coming from that i wasn't just making it up that i was citing an original source and this is how it was thought about and so here's an example that shows this principle in action yeah okay so i think appendix kind of brings towards the end of the book <laughs> so right. yeah so how long did it take uh, uh, to compile this work that's a little hard to say i began it many years ago because i was i've been I'm always fascinated by these types of charts and I I all I like them is I always learn something new. <laughs> okay. So every time I do a chart of a lost object I learn a new way to look at a symbol what a house means what a sign means what one of the what combustion means you know what one of the aspects. And so I began collecting these charts and putting them together over a series of years. and then finally thought this probably enough for a book here and i sent it to lewellen oh, okay great so so uh i think that's 
that that's what I, i just wanted to run through and talk about the book uh, on the eve of the release of the book uh, uh, i think the honor is mine so uh, if if you if you want to talk about uh, anything else about the book no, i think we've covered most things um i you know it's i try to include things that i that i dis, quote, discovered not personally but i discovered in the literature <laughs> that I wasn't so aware of before writing this or okay. things that really struck me as important as I was analyzing these charts and so it was sort of my notes to myself at a new things I've learned or new ways of looking at charts uh this every time I do one of these I learn something new or I sure. have a different appreciation of the symbolism and uh and it's part of what's nice about astrology that you're always every time you work at it you you come to see things a little differently or understand a little differently how it works okay uh that's great okay. and uh, i think i think that pretty much brings us towards the end of the video and uh, i think people can uh, order it through uh amazon i can share the link and is there any other place that people can order the book through well i think most major bookstores will carry it like here okay. in the united states barnes and nobles and you know so i think most major booksellers will carry it there's a bunch of them on there's book depository and there's oh, okay a, a books abe books.com right so it, i think it surely will be there on good reads as well so uh i think uh i would just recommend everyone to uh, go and check this book out because i think this is one of the few books uh, i'm not sure if there is any other, any other book on lost objects as specifically as this i'm sure there are traditional works but uh, in terms of uh, the work com- compilation of a work or uh, live practical case examples in terms of lost and horror i think this probably is the first book so thank you so much for working on this project and congratulations again on getting the book mm-hmm. out uh, so i hope uh, i hope many people benefit out of this book okay well thank you for inviting me and i appreciate it and i hope people like it we'll see yeah i'm sure they'll like it because in uh, as you said in horror it's all about whether it is right or wrong so uh, yeah. so it's it's about uh, application so right the only th- other thing i'd like to say is if <clears throat> people do decide to read the book i think the best way to do it is maybe to read the theory part but don't read my interpretations of the charts look at the charts first and try to figure out where the thing is or where the person is and then read how i did it and you may you may you probably will have other ways of approaching the chart that's great as a way of learning just try to do it yourself you'll have different experiences different understandings of the symbols and you may come up with an even better solution than i did which was i think the beauty of uh, uh... you know maybe a book is uh, almost it's it's a book come workbook people can uh, use the chart and uh, you know see as you said they can also can try and arrive at various decisions and uh, and they can see because they have the answer so they can see uh, whether they succeeded or not and right. if they But succeeded before they read the answer they should try to yeah, try the puzzle try. themselves exactly so if yeah. if the uh, if the answer is different from what you have given so there is another way of, uh, of finding out but and uh, w- one good thing that anyone who finds an alternate way uh, of finding out the result of the chart or the horror is maybe you can write uh, to anthony lewis and say that you found this alternate method because you know what anthony did probably he would also like to know how you arrived at the decision so it will be good to kind of have this communication with the author and see uh, how each other feel about a specific technique so which is a, which is a great platform for learning right and there are several horror groups on facebook and facebook. probably other platforms where you can post your charts with your interpretation and get feedback which is a good way to learn also exactly yeah especially the horror groups are really 
uh, uh, meaningful apart from a few uh, disturbing questions like uh, yeah. whether I will find the love of my life and so on. So, <laughs> so uh, and the other thing is to try it in your own life. If if you lose something or someone you know has lost something, they ask the question, give it a try. So sure. It, it is amazing when it works. You know, it's just. Uh, so, yeah, if uh, if there is nothing else, maybe we can just say one final congratulations before the book release. And uh, I, I'm very glad that we did this just on the eve of the release of the book. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's uh, the the book will probably release in another one hour in India, and I can't wait to place the order. So uh, it's f for you. At least I know it'll sell one copy. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure it's uh, many people are going to buy and many people are going to get benefited from the book, yeah. uh, which is probably the ultimate goal. So and thank you for your contribution to the community and uh, thanks for joining me today and good luck. Uh, okay, well, books. thank you. I, I always enjoy talking with you, Ashwin. Thank you. Okay.